I'm Bill Evans, and welcome to Carrizozo Music Incorporated, the host for this workshop and performance of the Banjo in America. The Banjo in America presents over 200 years of American history as experienced through the music of the five-string banjo. Carrizozo Music is a nonprofit organization celebrating its 14th year and is dependent on grants, foundations, and your generous donations. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Carrizozo Music has moved all performances to this virtual online platform for you to enjoy at any time. Part of the mission of Carrizozo Music is to provide school outreach programs, including concerts, workshops, and demonstrations to the children of New Mexico, many of whom don't often have the opportunity to experience a variety of music in live performance. Performances are funded in part by the New Mexico Humanities Council, New Mexico Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, West Half, the Otero County Electric Cooperative Incorporated Roundup Grants, the Tularosa Basin Telephone Company, Zia Gas, and your donations. Today, throughout the performance and afterwards, Carrizozo Music will be available to answer your questions via our email, carrizozomusic at gmail.com. All emails will be answered as quickly as possible. Our moderator today is Gwendolyn Watson, who may also be reached at the same email. In this first segment of this presentation, I will offer an overview of the history of the five-string banjo, and I will introduce you to the instruments and playing styles featured in the second concert segment. Thank you so very much for joining me for the Banjo in America. I am honored to be a part of Carrizozo Music this year, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. <laughs> Hi once again everyone, it's Bill Evans. The history of the American five-string banjo goes back hundreds of years to the Caribbean and to Africa. Europeans first wrote about African stringed instruments made of a gourd body as early as 1602. They often wrote of the griot, a musician attached to a social group or a tribe that was a historian for the tribe keeping account of battles and kings and queens in African history. Banjo was important in Africa in these years. The predecessor of the banjo had a gourd body and with a stick attached, and certain features of the African prototype of the banjo have been preserved to the present day in the American banjo. A stretched animal skin, or beginning in 1960s, a plastic drum head, is an important feature of the instrument, as well as a high-pitched string positioned on top, right where you would expect the lowest string to be, in easy location with the thumb. Many African styles, which were also found in the New World and are even played today, involve the right hand moving downward across the strings. We hear this in the banjo music of the 1800s, and it's preserved today in a style of music called claw hammer, or old-time banjo. By the 1690s, Europeans in the Caribbean, Martinique and Guadeloupe, wrote about stringed instruments made of a gourd body. In 1707, Hans Sloane published his accounts of his travels in the Caribbean, and as part of his book, published a drawing, which is our first known image of a banjo-type instrument in the New World. In this image, the banjo is actually positioned behind the first instrument, which Sloan credits to being a native in, uh, instrument of the Indian Caribbean. There are many African prototypes of the New World banjo that are still played today and have no doubt been played for hundreds of years. They have different numbers of strings. They look different. Sometimes the, the sound producing ch uh, chamber could be made of wood. And, and again, in this case, it, we have a gourd, again, with that stretched animal skin. This is an instrument that is played today in Africa called an Akanting by the Jola people of the Senegambian region. And many banjo researchers look at instruments like this as being perhaps the root of the New World banjo. Ideas about African instruments like this and how they're made and, and how they are played came to the New World, to the Caribbean and to the United States with the importation of West Africans as slaves. And that formed the earliest idea of the banjo in the New World. The way that West Africans play an instrument like this is very similar to the way that people played the banjo in the United States in the 1800s and the way that old-time music is played today, with the index finger still moving down across the strings. Take a look at this short segment 
of the musician Ikana Diata performing on a canting in Gambia. The first account we have of an instrument like the banjo in North America is in 1736. From a newspaper letter observing an African-American celebration with music featuring an instrument that was called the banjer, B-A-N-J-E-R. Thomas Jefferson called this instrument a banjer also in 1782 in his book Notes About Virginia. In the late 1700s, we have paintings that indicate what early banjos looked like in the United States. The painting The Old Plantation has a lot of a lot going on. Some folks have uh, assumed that this is a painting of a slave wedding. It takes place in Beaufort County, South Carolina. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that there's music for the occasion. And there's quite a, much detail given to this banjo. It has a gourd body and four strings. And even if you take a look at the right hand, you can see how the player is playing. Very much the same playing style of the right hand moving down across the strings. The banjo moved from being just an instrument associated with African Americans to being an instrument that was enjoyed by both whites and blacks across America and later in Europe with the rise in the 1830s and 1840s of minstrelsy. Minstrelsy was a theatrical phenomenon in which white musicians put black cork on their faces and depicted slave life with songs and supposedly comedic routines. In many ways, it cemented ideas of racism in this country that have persisted to this day. However, in terms of learning about the music of the early banjo, the music of minstrelsy gives us a lot of information, including what African Americans might have been playing as well. Because these are the years of the publication of the first instructional manuals. The instrument was that popular. 1858 was the date for Phil Rice's publication of the first minstrel manual. In this manual, it shows how to hold the banjo, how to tune the banjo, and how the right hand and left hand techniques play, along with hundreds of tunes. Minstrelsy was America's first nationally popular music and spread the banjo all across the United States. As the 19th century progressed, the banjo moved from being an instrument just associated with the minstrel stage to an instrument that could be capable of playing all kinds of music. As a matter of fact, it moved into upper middle class homes in the northern part of the United States and many women played the banjo. The style of music from the 1860s forward to about 1900 to 1910 is today called classic banjo. As you can see from this painting of the banjo lesson from 1893 by Mary Cassatt, that women frequently played the instrument. The banjos that would have been played in this particular setting are sometimes very, very ornate. And the playing style that is popular with classic banjo playing is a finger style, where instead of moving across the strings, the hand moves up. I'll play a couple of examples from this repertoire. It merges into ragtime in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Ragtime began in the late 1800s with the music of Scott Joplin and other uh, Midwestern African-American composers. Scott Joplin's father was a banjo player. The banjo moved to being an instrument of socializing and of the parlor and of leisure time to being an instrument that could be on the concert stage. Both white and black players using the classic finger picking style recorded also in the early recording industry beginning in the late 1800s and early 1900s, first on cylinders and then on uh, 78 RPM records. And banjos were made of all sizes and it produced an industry of stars such as Bess Osman. The music that was played by these classic banjo players was off of the written page. However, during these same years, Many folks who played the banjo all over the country, but especially in the South, learned by ear, learning traditions and ways of playing the banjo that they had learned from their family and from friends around them. A very vibrant tradition was created in the mountains of Virginia and North Carolina in the late 1800s and early 1900s. 
This way of playing the banjo is still very popular today. It's called old time banjo or claw hammer. And like the banjo of the 1800s, the right hand technique is very similar where the fingers move down across the strings. <laughs> This way, in the music of today, the African instinct and influence is still very much alive. In the 20th century, the banjo and, and its technique and the people who played it moved out in all kinds of directions. In the mid-20th century, Pete Seeger brought the banjo into folk music and into popular song with his group called The Weavers, and he used the banjo as part of his message of social change. The boy from North Carolina, Earl Scruggs, developed a three-finger banjo technique that was used in a style called bluegrass music. In bluegrass music, you put a finger pick on your thumb, and you put metal finger picks on your index and middle fingers, and Earl's style is brilliant and very complex and perfectly suited for the layout of the banjo. It's this style of banjo playing that perhaps is the most popular today and can be heard all over the world. The finger technique and the fretboard knowledge that you gain from playing bluegrass music can enable you to play anything on the banjo. Modern performers such as Bela Fleck, Nelson Brown, and Noam Pakelney play everything from Bach to startlingly original music. And the best recent news regarding the banjo is that young African American players are rediscovering it, exploring the African roots of the instrument, and creating their own music using the five string banjo. That brings the banjo back into the shared tradition that it always should have been. If you decide to take up the banjo, you will love it. You, I've been playing now for over 45 years, and uh, it has brought me so much joy to communicate my love for the banjo with other people. And whether you play bluegrass or clawhammer or your own original music, just have fun with the instrument. I will see you soon for the Banjo in America. <laughs>
and I want you to hear the two pieces and we'll and listen for the similarities between the sound of the African piece and the sound of this early American piece on the banjo. Beginning with the African piece, Pompey ran away. <laughs> Pompey ran away from 1780 in Phil Rice's jig from the mid-1800s, played on this bonza made of a gourd body. Let's move forward in time now to the mid-1800s. The banjo would have been so popular, it was so popular in those days, that factories, small factories, were making banjo-type instruments. And look at some of the differences in construction that occurred during this time. We have no gourd, no plant gourd, but instead a wooden hoop to be the primary sound chamber. We've got an extra string on this instrument, five strings instead of four. That high string is still on top, and we have some metal that is used to hold down the animal skin more tightly to make the banjo louder. By the mid-1800s, the instrument was played by African Americans and white Americans all over the United States, and folks even played the banjo in Europe. One of the musicians who popularized the banjo nationally was a man named Joel Walker Sweeney. He was a white musician who came from Virginia and he learned to play the banjo from the African Americans that were slaves in the area where he lived. He took these traditions and he went to New York City and he, uh, along with other musicians, created a form of music called minstrelsy. That was uh, the fiddle and the banjo and percussion instruments. The music of minstrelsy took the banjo all over the United States and into Europe, and we know what this music sounded like because the instrument was so popular that instructional manuals were printed that we can look at today that give us an uh, indication of what the music sounded like. There's much of African influence in this music of the mid-1800s, specifically in the way that I'm playing with my right hand moving down across the strings. But I want to play you a medley of tunes that would come from Ireland. So there's nothing more American than this combination of European, in this case Irish, influence in the form of a melody with the way of playing which is derived from Africa on a banjo made in America. Three pieces, Devil's Dream, Bully for All and St. Patrick's Day from 1858 and Thank you. 
the banjo evolved and changed over the decades and centuries that people attached a lot more metal to the instrument in order to make the skin or the plastic head even tighter. If we compare the number of brackets on the 18th century instrument with this instrument from the early 1900s, you see that this has a lot more metal. Also, the inlay is very, very beautiful on this instrument. This is a very decorative instrument. There's carving in what is called the heel inlay here in what's called the peg head. And many times this was done by immigrants had, that had just arrived in the United States from Europe who were bringing the crafts that they knew in their home countries in Europe to the United States to make banjos. Like all the other instruments that we've been seeing so far, this banjo also has a high fifth string. By the 1860s, folks were experimenting with different ways of playing. They were what was called playing in an up-picking style. That's where my index and middle fingers and sometimes my ring and pinky are going to move up across the string and the thumb moves down. Guitar players might call this finger-picking today. And it's a very common way of playing on a banjo. And many folks play classical guitar in the same way. I want to play you a piece that dates from 1865. This was a time in which some folks were trying to make music that was quite complicated on the instrument. And I want to play a theme and variations, which means a basic melody that is then changed and repeated a number of times, but changed each time. Theme and variations from a banjo player named Frank B. Converse. He took a very familiar melody that most Americans would have known in the 1860s called Home Sweet Home. And boy, he does a lot of different things to it. See what happens. Here is Home Sweet Home from 1865, Frank B. Converse. <laughs>
was pretty fancy, wasn't it? 1865. Well, the banjo was very, very popular in America, all over the United States, all through the 1800s. In the late 1800s, a new kind of music swept America by storm. It was African-American in origin as well. A group of composers in the Midwest around Missouri, led by a composer named Scott Joplin, introduced a new kind of making music to America called ragtime. Ragtime combined the syncopated rhythms that, and melodies that had been popular among African-Americans for many, many years with a multi-part and very complicated arrangements. The music of ragtime swept the country by storm. People sang ragtime. They played ragtime in string bands and bands with horns. Scott Joplin even wrote a ragtime opera. Elements of ragtime are heard in American popular music today in the chord progressions and rhythms of everything from jazz to rock and roll to hip hop. Well, the rhythms of ragtime were perfect for the five string banjo. Scott Joplin's father, as a matter of fact, played the five string banjo. I want to play you a piece that dates from 1908 by a New York composer and dance band leader named Paul Eno that will introduce you to the rhythms and the allure, the beautiful sound of ragtime music. This piece is called A Ragtime Episode. you now to an instrument called a zither banjo. This instrument was made in England in the early 1900s by a banjo builder named Alfred Kemeyer, who also wrote pieces of music for the instrument. When we look at what happened to the banjo through all of these hundreds of years in Africa, the Caribbean, the United States, and later England, some people played music that was very complicated, almost sounded like classical music. Other people played music that was appropriate for old-time country dancing in the road. Uh, other people just played music that sounded good to their ears. For Alfred Kemeyer, he listened to a lot of European classical music, and he tried to apply that to this instrument, which has a very soft sound because of the wooden body. You'll notice that the peg head of this instrument has six tuners. Wait a minute, the banjo only has five strings. Well, 
It was easy for banjo builders in England to use guitar tuners, and you have an extra tuner. The banjo only has five strings. We have six tuners. If one of them happens to break, which sometimes happens, you have an extra tuner that you can simply switch the strings. Like the other banjos I brought with me, the highest string that is in location, easy location with the thumb, is the highest pitched string. But you'll notice that there's no tuning peg midway up the neck, as on the other instruments. Well, what is happening here is that there's a little hole in the neck and the string runs underneath a tunnel that goes all the way up and then comes out here for the tuner. So we still have the high pitch on top, but we just can't see the tuner. That makes it a little bit easier for the banjo player to move up and down the neck. This song, Ballad Number no. 1, is something that's really quite a bit different. It doesn't sound like what the kind of music that we normally associate with the banjo. It's soft and quiet. So this would be a time to kind of take a deep breath and close your eyes and imagine maybe clouds in the sky or just something uh, really beautiful that you hear from the music. So Alfred Kemeyer's Ballad No. 1, written in the early 1900s. What a different kind of sound that is huh? from this zither banjo made in England. Let's come back to America and take a trip to the North Carolina mountains. How about that? I want to introduce you to a, a banjo that was made of, by a friend of mine who lives in Walkertown, North Carolina. And his name is Riley Boggus. And he is part of a tradition that we call old time music that's still very popular in America today. Old time music is made with the fiddle and the banjo and the guitar and the mandolin. And the tunes go back hundreds of years with roots in both white and black American music styles. Before people started making records in the 1930s, these traditions on the banjo were oftentimes in places like the mountains in the country shared by whites and blacks alike. And then later when the record company started recording this music, uh, the the music that was called country music was oftentimes made by white performers, and music that they called blues was oftentimes made by African-American performers. But the reality of it is, is that everybody played this music. The style that would have been heard in the North Carolina mountains around the Round Peak area, the playing technique on the banjo is very, very much like the playing technique that we would have heard in the mid-1800s, going back over 150 years, and even longer than that, perhaps back to the Caribbean and resembling some African styles of playing as well, with moving down across the strings on the banjo. 
One of the things that Riley did for this banjo that makes it really, really neat and cool is that there's a piece of brass here in the fingerboard. Normally, on a guitar, you would have frets, right? And there are frets here that you can put your finger behind, but by having the brass here, you can slide up and down and get all the pitches that are in between the frets, which is great for a bluesy kind of old-time music. I want to play you a song now called Reuben. Well now Reuben made a train run from England to Spain couldn't get no letters from his home. Well, you don't believe I'm gone. Watch this train that I brought home. I'm 900 miles away from home. Now I'm 900 miles away from my wife and my child. I wish I was 900 more I'll listen to that train whistle Well, I never did love but one little girl, and I'm sorry I ever loved her. She had ruby lips and rosy cheeks, you ought to hear her lying Sidetrack the train and go home. Well, now Reuben made a train, ran from England to Spain, couldn't get no letters from his home. Some old-time music from the present day that dates back 50, 60 years from North Carolina, even more with very, very deep roots. Reuben played on this banjo. This style of playing, by the way, today is called claw hammer, and there's lots of, lots of talk about why it's called claw hammer, but when you do play, you kind of hold your hand like a claw, and it's sometimes called frailing banjo. All, all of it is good old-time banjo playing. Well, let's now go to the instrument that I started out with. And it's an instrument that dates from 1930. The Gibson Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And in, well gosh, way back, how many years ago? Maybe about 70 years ago, uh, a player named Earl Scruggs came out of North Carolina. And he played with a mandolin player named Bill Monroe and later a guitar player named Lester Flatt. And he came up with a brilliant style of playing that was perfectly designed for this instrument that is quite loud with a, a piece that attaches to the back and a big, big uh, place for the animal skin to stretch across later plastic. And like all the other banjos, it's got five strings, it's got that high string on top, but very, very loud. And Earl Scruggs plays with two fingers and a thumb. 
which no one really had done before in his part of the country. He also put these metal finger picks and the plastic thumb pick on his fingers to make the instrument a lot louder and a lot faster. And Earl Scruggs' style is associated with a style of music called bluegrass, which is a kind of blend of country and folk and blues. And it's very, very popular. This is probably the most popular style of banjo played today, this three-finger Earl Scruggs bluegrass style. And I want to play you a medley of Earl's tunes for you right now, beginning with one of the first songs I learned called Cripple Creek. was the Carter family. A group from Virginia in the early 1920s made some very important records of one of the most popular country music groups in the country. Maybelle Carter played guitar in that band and Earl Scruggs loved the way that she played guitar and he also loved their songs. One of the songs that the Carter family sang was called Little Darling Pal Mine. Woody Guthrie, the folk singer that traveled around the country, also knew that song and he took the melody of that song and wrote This Land Is Your Land. Here is Earl Scruggs' version of Little Darling Pal of Mine. <laughs> pretty far away from even the smallest town. One of the closest towns was called Flint Hill. And there was a train that went through Flint Hill every day that he could hear from his home coming into the station. Steam trains make a lot of noise. And when Earl went to write his own original banjo tunes, he thought of his childhood home and that train. He called this his tune Flint Hill Special. <laughs> Carazozo Music again for sponsoring this performance, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to close with Earl Scruggs' most famous song. He wrote it way back in 1949 when he was about 24 or 25 years old, but most folks in the United States didn't hear it until the 1960s, and it captures perfectly the drive and power and just beauty of Earl Scruggs' three-finger banjo style. I hope to see you all somewhere down the road. Let's make some music together. And uh, I'll close out this presentation with Earl Scruggs' Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Thanks, everybody.